Thank you, Reed Campbell, Councillor Sipe. All in favor? Carried. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest, if any. None noted. Okay. Moving to reports. Uh, 4.1 preparation for 2018 budget uh, between Dwayne and Donna. I think they're going to take that away now. Four years. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Reeve and members of the council for your time and staff. So Don and I have been working on this, and this is a first of a series of presentations regarding the 2018 uh, budget. Um, the presentation is, uh, provides a high-level overview of the municipality's finances, and it summarizes and looks at historical spending and our forecasting. Um, it also highlights the future decisions that uh, the Council will be making um, in the not-so-distant future. <laughs> the presentation is intended to serve as a reference as we work through the budget process, um, and will, will be referred to as we work through the draft budget. Uh, as staff, we want to ensure Council is positioned and well prepared uh, for the budget that staff will be bringing forward for Council's consideration. In the presentation itself, you're going to see some numbers. Uh, the numbers are factual and they have been gathered from publicly available documents. So everything that you're going to see here is currently available to the public. The numbers are, in are included in the presentation simply just to illustrate the historical spending and the forecast trends. So they're not intended to be the focus of the debate or the discussion. It's what the numbers are telling us and not so much the numbers themselves. Uh, staff are recommending at the conclusion of the presentation that Council receive the presentation uh, for information purposes. Are there any questions in terms of what we're going to be moving forward? Or? Okay. Hearing none. <clears throat> As we go through this presentation, we did ask that you consider three questions. And the three questions are as follows. What are Council's priorities? How are priorities going to be determined? And how will long-term capital planning decisions to be made? In 2013, this Council adopted a strategic plan. The plan has been used by staff in preparing reports and recommendations. Council needs to start thinking about her priorities beyond 2018. With respect to the second question, how are priorities going to be determined, there's three different ways that the priorities can be established. They can be determined by recommendations from staff, they can be determined by the public, or they can be determined here at the council table. Last question, how long, how will long-term capital planning decisions to be made? This question um, deals with and involves looking at a number of reports and studies that have been completed over the last year and they've all come with significant price tags. Council needs to consider the reports and needs to identify and determine their long-term spending priorities. And I'm Ventura Vergana, who will step us through the next few slides, and I'll come back later and highlight some of the observations and provide you with some takeaways. Thank you, Dwayne. Okay, so where does the money go? You have seen this slide before, but the purpose of this slide is to show that in the 2017 budget, approximately 60% of the dollars levied by North Huron stayed in North Huron. And that total levy was just over 8 million um, when you add up all the three pieces there. So 8,234,000 was, was the total levy. So approximately 30% went to here in county and about 15% of the dollars raised through taxation went to the various school boards. The point to be made here is that not all property taxes that um, we levy, not all the property tax dollars raised support North Huron uh, programs and services. And again, approximately 60% of those taxes go to support um, the program and services that council supplies. Okay, this slide shows the spending commitments. So if you look through the various categories here, I'm not gonna go through them all, as you have seen this slide before, and it gives you an overview of all the commitments, programs, and services provided by North Huron. 
Most of what you see here is usually provided by a much larger municipality. And if you were to prepare a similar chart for other municipalities for our size, it would look much different. The chart would be smaller and would have significantly less commitments. And some of the examples that small municipalities usually do not have an airport, trailer park, or its own police force, to name a few. And we have a number of duplicate uh, services that we provide listed on the chart. Okay. The next slide summarizes our debt obligations. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, our annual debt repayment is $250,000 approximately. So that includes principal of $178,000 and interest of $71,000. If you look at the year paid off column, you will see that we will have debt incurred till the year 2032 on the EST Center. And the first one paid off will be that roads project um, in 2021. So it is a good practice to redirect these funds to an infrastructure reserve fund, and it is, it is not a good idea to redirect the funds towards any other regular operating expense. So for 2018 <coughs> commitments, this slide provides a glimpse into some of the numbers you will see in the draft 2018 budget. This list is not, exhaust, not exhaustive and will become clearer after our meetings with the department heads. As part, the first one up there, Arthur Street, is, whoops, sorry, is my pointer working? Yeah, I'm seeing it. There we go. There. Arthur Street. Okay, so for Arthur Street, that um, will be at a cost of 212500 and that's part of our joint land strategy with Morris Turnberry, and Arthur Street needs to be completed in 2018. Council has committed a $50,000 donation to the Wingman District Hospital for five years, and that will be until 2020. Council has a balance owing on Memorial Hall of $235,388, and that's the remaining amount left out of the $500,000 commitment made to that project. The total cost for the um, Mill Street project in Blythe um, is a, estimated at about $3.1 million. If we don't get the OCSIF top-up funding, Council will be faced with a 222,000 repayment, 222,000 repayment program for the next 15 years. This will be in addition to our existing debt obligations. Also, if we aren't successful with our greenhouse gas um, challenge fund application that is going to be due tomorrow, we would be looking at $414,218 in expenses in 2018 for the LED streetlight program. It's right there. The master <laughs> servicing report is underway, but we don't know yet what the report will recommend, but the information that's going to come out of that report is going to be extremely valuable for a go-forward basis. The next item is the daycare roof report, and so a new roof is needed on the daycare. Staff are looking at replacing the roof in 2019. However, prior to going to, te to tender, there's some engineering work that needs to be completed in 18. And that estimate has come in at about $30,000. The pay equity study is underway, but at this point, we don't know what impact that will have. We do know that the provincial government is signaling a minimum wage increase, which will also impact our 2018 budget. So our total here of commitments known to date is $1,164,328. So if we move on, some of the slides that you'll see are divided up into categories that we use to file our information to the ministry as laid out in the FIR for the financial information return. So we're going to talk a little bit about those categories. So first off, we have general government, which covers council administration. And of course that looks up, up here at the office, we look after agendas, budgets, taxes, those types of things. Recreation, oh, sorry, recreation and culture. 
is the um, parks, libraries, museum, and memorial hall. Planning and development covers planning, zoning, and the um, community partnership and economic development. Social and family is all the child care programs. Health is for the cemetery aspect, and that includes Blythe, Wingham, and all the closed cemeteries. Environmental is covering water, sewer, and storm for both Earl and Urban, Urban and the Waste Department. Transportation covers roads, street lighting, and the airport. And protection covers fire, police, court security, prisoner transport, conservation authority, building, EST, and emergency planning. So if you keep those categories in mind as we um, go through the next slides, that will be very helpful. Okay, so on this next slide, what we're trying to show you here is North Huron's operating expenses for each of those service categories over the last five years. To note, some of these expenses do also have offsetting um, revenues. But as you can see, protection and recreation, sorry, I keep flipping this thing. Come on. As you can see, protection and recreation, cult, recreation and culture services are consistently your two high, highest operating expenditures. Planning and development here at the bottom is consistently your lowest operating expenditure. We are highlighting Council's historical operating expenses to assist you in preparing for the 2018 budget. Going back to, to the three questions Dwayne highlighted at the start of this presentation, Council needs to consider how priorities are going to be determined. As an aside, transportation or public works tends to be the highest expenditure for most municipalities, but that's not the case in North Huron. Transportation is the third highest here. So you have um, protection up here at the top for 2016 at 2,492, and then transportation, the third one down, and they're at 1,824. And again, these numbers all come from the FIR. So carry on to the next slide. This slide is operating expenses forecast at 2% CPI. So if we use the 2017 as the base year and project out how much money we will need over the next five years to continue providing the existing programs and services, you will see from this chart that we will require approximately $14 million by 2022. <coughs> so based on the 2% rate of inf inflation, this is an increase of approximately $1.3 million. To understand this number, it's beneficial to look at revenue and expenditures in each of the service categories. And we will be doing that. So the um, 2017 was the base year, and that was at 12624 And then as it increases 2% each year, then you can see that um, that's how we get up to the $13,938,000. Okay, so if we move on. So we're going to go through each of those categories that we talked about and the first one is general government and this covers both operating and capital. So when you look at the operating and capital expenditures for 2017, the general government category shows a surplus down here, sorry, of, of 419,546. This, this is in large part due to the fact that we apply the whole OMPF grant to the general government category. This surplus is used to offset the deficit in several other service categories. However, as you will see, the deficit in the other service categories far exceeds this surplus. So again, that relates to the OMPF grant. Next is recreation and culture. So for recreation and culture in 2017, the service category is showing revenue of approximately 1.4 million and expenses of 2.8 million. This results in a net cost of approximately 1.364 million. This deficit does not include the capital expenditure for the Blythe Memorial Hall. 
So throughout this, wherever possible, we've taken the anomaly of the Blythe Memorial Hall project out of it because it's, it uh, um, has such large numbers associated with it, and we'll make notes of that as we move along. Okay, next we have planning and development. So moving into planning and development, this category shows revenue of 39,100 and expenditures of approximately 230,000, which results in a deficit of 190,000. This service category includes community partnership donations and in 2017, um, that category was a total of 53,000 and then of that we donated 50,000 to the hospital. Next, we'll move on to social and family services. These are the programs and services that we provide um, in regard to our child care programs. In 2017, we generated revenue of approximately 1.1 million, and there were expenditures of 1.1 million as well. So this, the projected deficit for 2017 in this category is approximately 17,000, which is very close to break even. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about the um, health services. And health services really relates to the cemeteries. So we have the, um, in the area of health cemeteries, our revenue is projected at 114,000 and our projected expense is 153,000 for a net deficit of approximately 40,000. So this covers the Blyeth and the Wingham and the closed cemeteries that North Huron looks after. Okay. Moving on to environmental services. In the area of environmental services, 2017 is showing revenue of 3.4 million, expenses of 3.7 million, and a deficit cost of 276,000 approximately. Now, as you can see up here, water and sewer balance to zero, so that whole 276,000 relates to the um, uh, waste and divert waste diversion and disposal department because again water and sewer user pay okay next we move on to transportation services so transportation services are showing revenue of two million it's over two million and expenditures of 3.7 million for a net <coughs> cost of approximately 1.7 million. It's important to note though, however, that the revenue here is, um, includes the OCIF grant, transfers from reserves, borrowing, and the new category of equipment rental revenue. So that's a bit of a change there for revenue in 2017. Okay, next we're moving on to protection services. Last but not least, the 2017 numbers for protection services show $800,000 in revenue and $2.8 million in expenditures. So therefore, the net cost to the North Huron taxpayers is just over the $2 million. Because of the area rating, Wingham Ward residents pay a greater percentage of the policing costs, and you can see the policing costs um, yeah, Wingham police costs are included in this line along with the OPP for Blyeth and East Walnut. So this is a summary of the 2017 operating and capital <coughs> expenses for each of the service categories that we have just been going through. So through property taxes, North Huron residents are paying approximately 5.2 million in property taxes towards programs and services that they receive. The significance of this number will be highlighted later on in the presentation as now we're going to move forward and look at our capital expenses. So I realize this slide is hard to see, but the key note on this slide is that it summarizes our capital expenses in 2017, and it also shows how our capital expenses were financed. 
So I want to make note, <coughs> though, however, that again, down here at the bottom, um, the large portion, 2 million, 2.4 million of those capital expenditures did belong to Memorial Hall. So if you start at the bottom left, cor left corner, you will see that in 2017, oh man, I'm having trouble with this flicker here tonight. There. You will see that um, in the bottom left hand corner, we have 5.8 million in capital improvements. Going across the bottom slide, you will see $625,000 that was received in the form of grants. You can see that $625,000. So that was for $3,000 for Trillium Grant, $105,000 for the OCIF grant, and for the pool project, there was another $150,000 in Trillium, and then for Memorial Hall, there was the federal government grant in $367,000. So then if you move across, our intention was to borrow $810,000 to fund two different projects. One was the plow truck at $270,000 and the LED streetlight conversion program. So now we have the um, LED program will not, will not see expenses for that actually into 2018 but we have had some of the expenses for the plow truck, but we won't have them all for 17 also. So some of that will be moved forward to 18. That was our long-term borrowing. So from reserves, this $1.2 million figure, again, 500,000 of that was for Memorial Hall, but you can see that we have taken um, significant money out of our reserves for 2017. User fees of 952000 pertain to water and sewer as they are self-funded. And we have been saving up our gas tax money over the last few years for $300,000 to be able to complete the Mill Street project. Not complete it, but put it towards the Mill Street project. And so that money will go towards the phase two that was done um, in late of 2017. So the number here with the most significance is the amount raised by taxation, which is only a hundred, just under a hundred and ninety thousand dollars that was financed through taxation. So they received five point eight million dollars in capital improvements, and again, it was only um, financed through one hundred and ninety thousand on the taxes. On the positive side, council had provided residents with five point eight million worth of capital improvements but this spending rate is not sustainable at the current tax rate and this will be explained in more detail later on in the presentation. But just to finish that off then the other column pertains mostly to um, money we received for Memorial Hall and some other donations to get our total of 5.8 million in capital. <laughs> So to move forward on capital planning decisions, we are looking ahead. We have a number of reports and studies on our capital assets that have been commissioned. You may not have seen all of these reports or seen them in depth at this point, but you will over the next uh, uh, um, period during the budget process. So the first one is the asset management plan. And in it, they're recommending that over the next 20 years that we have a dedicated infrastructure levy of $128,000 or a 2.6% tax increase to cover that. The roads needs study is showing that we need to spend $1 million per year or for the next five years to maintain what we have. The bridge study is telling us that we need to spend $11,000 per year for the next 10 years to maintain our bridges. The public works equipment replacement schedule is showing that we need to spend $585,000 per year for the next 20 years to replace what we have. And a lot of our existing equipment is already beyond its life expectancy. The museum study, the feasibility study is recommending a 3.8 million that needs to be spent to maintain the building. 
But if you were to borrow that money over a 15 year time period, the repayment schedule is showing an annual payment of about $265,000 a year for 15 years. Other reports and studies in the works include a servicing master plan, public works building assessment report, and a house and dam study. Without these reports, and assuming we follow all of the recommendations, we are looking at an annual expenditure of $1.8 million to maintain what we have. This does not include any additional infrastructure which we require to support new development. The message we wanted to leave with you is that the amount you spend on capital and assets needs to increase. Staff will work with you on how to achieve this. However, it is ultimately council's decision on existing and on existing and future on existing future and assets and how they are financed. We need to ensure that when a resident turns on a water tap or leaves home to visit their family and friends, that they have potable water and safe roads to travel on, for example. So if we move on to what those capital numbers look like out um, in a trend for the next five years using CPI. You can see that we used the base year of 2017 and if you take the 1.8 million figure from the previous slide and apply a 2% inflation rate over the next five years, this is how it would look. So the previous slide said 1,861,000 and 2% all the way through there would end you up at 2,054,000 and that would be an approximately a $200,000 increase over those five years. So we're going to look at the reserves and reserve funds. And again, I know this printing is fairly small. Um, and so the reason that um, in 2017, $1.2 million was taken from the reserves to fund the $5.8 million in capital improvements. As you can see, the amount in the reserves increased from $7 million in 2012 to up by 10 million to, to, in 2016. And this looks good, however, when you start discussing the numbers further, you will see a majority of the growth is in the water and sewer uh, reserve, so that you can see how they are growing um, substantially. In 2017, approximately $120,000 was taken out of this WSIP reserve you can see that it was at 142 and now it's only down to 20. And that $120,000 was taken out to pay for the shared services initiative. The 2016 roads amount over here of $175,000, that is allocated for the house and dam. And some of those funds have been spent uh, this year as for the 2017 budget. The water and wastewater rates that we were talking about and how they have increased is because in 2015, we increased the dedicated capital levy from $10 a month to the $15 a month, um, which has significantly, significantly um, helped those reserves to grow forward. The working funds are showing a balance of 2.7 million and the figure includes a number of projects in all service categories, um, including dollars to pay for the daycare roof, which needs to be replaced in 2019. So various department heads put money into those working funds reserves as a way to save up um, until they can go forward with um, their particular project. However, it only takes a motion from council to reallocate those reserves into another project. So one of our goals for year end is to take and rename and redefine some of those working funds into larger categories. So for example, like Pat has, you know, 10,000 for a reserve for Olympia and 10,000 for this. So we're going to switch the names on some of those into just strictly um, facilities and, and equipment and that type of thing. So it's the same amount of money. We're just going to rename them. We also have uh, the sick leave fund, and that was, as you know, we fund our own short-term disability program. 
So we have about $24,000 in there. And again, the gas tax, we've talked about this gas tax money and uh, we've been saving that up, as I said, to be able to use for the Mill Street project um, due to our unsuccessful grant application. So we do have the OSIF top up application in and, and uh, we're very hopeful that uh, we'll have some good news on it. Okay, so I'm going to turn this back over to Dwayne now, and he's going to talk to you about the revenue. Thanks, Liz. So this uh, slide uh, shows the revenue sources for the municipality. So the municipality generates revenue through taxation, through grants, for user fees, other municipalities, and other possible sources of revenue. So the taxation bar um, is is the money. Oh, it's touchy. <laughs> so these are the dollars that have been raised over the last five years through taxation. These are the, the red is the dollars that have been received through grants. The green is the grant the so our user fee money that has been received. Your purple is revenue from other municipalities, and then you have your blue, which is your other revenue. So um, as you can see, approximately one third of the total expenses in uh, 2017 um, and through the five years has been raised through taxation. Um, historically, our grants have been running around on average about $2 million that we've been receiving. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that grant money is never received. Sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not. In terms of your user fees, your user fees are primarily your water and your wastewater. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, funds in there from um, burials from cemeteries and things like that. Uh, your purple, as I've indicated, is revenue from other municipalities. And this is dependent upon any agreements and arrangements that we have with other municipalities. Um, sometimes those agreements can be amended in our favor. Sometimes they're result in amendments against us. Uh, and sometimes they can be canceled altogether. And then your other, which is your very small portion, is your other interest and in that that we accumulate. The point of the slide here is that in terms of the revenue that we generate from, the, from these various sources, everything above the blue is very, I, the term I use is volatile. We have no guarantee of anything above the blue. As a municipality, what we do have control over is our bottom. That's our property taxation. And as you can see, we've running 4.2, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, and 4.8. So generally speaking, uh, we haven't seen what I would consider you know, to be significant tax increases. There has been tax increases. And we're going to come into that a little bit later. So speaking of taxation, the property taxes are based on assessment. And this graph shows that our taxable assessment has continued to grow. What it also shows, however, is that our assessment growth has, has been slow. Uh, we're not seeing any major growth or development in municipality. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, which is looking at our average assessment. This slide shows the average assessment for each property type for 2016 and 2017. If you look at the last column, so 2016 average assessments and 2017, what I want to do is draw your attention to the last column. In the last column, you'll see growth in average assessments for vacant lands, farms, industrial, and commercial. But what we're seeing are, for example, government, institutional, uh, commercial, and residential. We're showing declines in all the other property types. Something to keep in mind in terms of when you're raising taxation dollars is that um, it takes $48,000 of additional dollars. Um, to raise $40,000 additional dollars, it results in a 1% tax increase. If our average assessments to continue to decline, as they have been, a greater percentage increase may be, need, may, may be needed to raise the same dollars. In the next slide, I'm going to show you what council historically has been doing. So to raise an additional $100,000 in taxation, um, for us in North Huron, 
taxes need to be raised 2.25%. If I could use a comparison, in Elliott Lake, a 1% tax increase is needed to raise an additional $100,000. Elliott's average assessment is higher than North Huron's, so subsequently a lower tax rate, but you raise the same number of dollars. In Goderich, a 1.3% a 1 tax increase is needed to raise an additional 100000 And again, the town's average assessment is higher than North Huron's. If assessment values remain the same or decline, the percentage increases needed to raise the same dollars are going to trend upwards. Like all municipalities, we need to be proactive in attracting growth and development to our municipality. Often, we find there's a lot of tension uh, given to the percentage increase, which are these numbers, and less attention given to the actual what, what percentage tax increase is required to raise the dollars. I just want to flip to our asset management plan for a second in terms of the recommendations that is contained there. It recommends that we do a financing strategy for full, for, for full funding over the next 20 years. It also recommends that we increase tax revenues by 2.6% for the next 20 years. It recommends we increase wastewater rates by 3.2, increase water rates by 1.2, and that we allocate gas tax OCF grant revenue to eligible projects. It also recommends that we reallocate our debt payments um, as a debt is paid off, which uh, Don alluded to earlier, and to increase our capital budgets by inflation in addition to the deficit phasing. So on that last point in particular, there's a multi thing happening here. One is you're increasing your capital budget by inflation, but then you're also doing your deficit phasing. So it's a double whammy. So this brings us in terms of how does council determine its priorities. In 2013, council adopted a strategic plan. The strategic plan identifies council priorities to the year 2018, which is next year. The plan needs to be revisited in 2019. When you read the strategic plan more closely, um, it appears council's two top priorities are to attract new business <coughs> and residents and for the municipality to be fiscally responsible and strive for operational excellence. This is not to say the other items on the slides are not priorities. However, when you look at the strategic plan in more detail, those two, attracting new business and residents and being fiscally responsible, um, <coughs> um, receive a great, great amount of detail of attention and discussion. If you think back to an earlier slide, I'm going to show you Council's two top service categories of expenditures over the last five years, protection and recreation were the top two service top services of expenditure. The planning and development category, which includes growth and development, is in fact our lowest expenditure, and yet, <coughs> according to our strategic plan, it's our top priority. The transportation service category includes, as Donna indicated, roads, bridges, and the airport. <coughs> From an earlier slide, we know that transportation services ranks third highest um, next to protection, recreation, and culture. If you look at expenditures only, and we're just not revenue, simply expenditures, <coughs> we spend over $5 million on protection and recreation and culture. We, we spend 230 million on growth and development. This takes me back to one of the questions that led to the start of the presentation, which is what are Council's priorities? It also raised the question whether Council still deems the strategic plan to be valid. I'll leave you with these questions to ponder, and we can discuss them later as we go through the process. <clears throat> so, as a municipality, we're blessed with strengths and opportunities. <clears throat> there are many more, but these are just some that we came up with. So, we have designated residential lands. We have the Blythe Memorial Hall. We've got the Emergency Service Training Center. We have a Desti Destination Blythe Initiative that is underway, it's being led by RTO4. From a transportation perspective, we're excellently situated. We've got Highway 4 that runs through our municipality, and we've got County Road 25, and we've got Highway 86, or County Road 86. So transportation corridors is a big strength or an asset for us. We have active business improvement associations, both in Blythe and Wingham. We're moving forward with the Economic Development Committee, which is a great step forward. 
and we have a state-of-the-art <coughs> But like all municipalities, we do have our challenges. Some we can control, some we can't. So in terms of our challenges, we do have slow tax assessment growth. We do have servicing, or we provide servicing well beyond our borders. <coughs> in some instances, we have agreements with other municipalities for those services, and in other instances, for example, recreation, residents come from afar and come and use our services. We have rising OPP costs um, in Blythe and East Wawanosh. We have rising utility costs. We have no control over those. Rising wage and benefit costs, and that speaks to the earlier comment with respect to minimum wage increase, which is the next one. We have declining industrial commercial values. The asset management plan is telling us that we have an infrastructure deficit and it's growing. And we do have a geographic configuration just in terms of um, we're linear in our geographic area. Here are some of the challenges um, that uh, our new economic development committee, um, I, I would suggest, needs to consider and, to, and focus. Um, we have storefront vacancies in both Wingham and Blythe. Um, it's, it's widely been discussed in the community that we have an accommodation need. We also have a labor shortage. We have employers who are busing folks in so they can run their businesses. We have aging infrastructure, and we do have a limited industrial base. So in terms of what, what do we want you to think about or walk away with, um, we do have debt obligations until 2032. We're, we're, we're committed to 2032 in our debts. We have 2018 commitments of $1.1 million. So before we even get started, we already are committed. Our two highest expenditures are protection and recreation and cultural services. Our lowest expenditure is development. To maintain existing services, uh, our operating budget needs to increase by 1.3 million over the next five years. Um, we have a budget of this year for 2017 of 16 million dollars. Of the budget, five, only five million is raised through taxation. We spent or are spending 5.8 million on capital projects. Two million was funded by reserves, borrowing. Only, only 190,000 was funded by taxation. And over two million is needed per year over the next five years to fund our future capital expenditures, the 1.8 million that we discussed earlier. Other considerations are that our reserves and reserve funds total 10 million. Of that 10 million, five is water and wastewater. We can't touch it, essentially. It's, it's, it's already been committed. So you basically have five million left and you took 1.2 out of reserves in 2017. So if you continue to take 1.2 out of reserves for the next two or three years, that five million is going to be depleted very, very quickly. You have a slow tax assessment growth. Okay, that's something, an area that, uh, you know, you know, as a municipality, we can work on that. Um, it is going to take some time. But there are other costs, like increasing uh, in other costs that we have no control over, like utilities and minimum wage. Whether we like it or not, we're going to have to pay. And we don't have any control over those. And through agreements, I think some municipalities currently contribute $610,000 to, to our annual budget. Again, those agreements, you know, they can be amended in our favor, against our favor, or canceled altogether by either us or by the other municipality. So as I stated at the beginning, the presentation here is intended to serve as a reference as we work through the 2018 budget process. We're going to refer back to this presentation as we work through the budget. As staff, you want to ensure council is positioned and well prepared for the budget we're going to be bringing forward for your consideration. We ask that you receive this report for information and ponder these three questions in advance of the budget deliberations. Questions are, for consideration, council, what are council's priorities? How are priorities going to be determined? And as they've indicated, <coughs> there are different ways to determine priorities. And how will long-term capital planning be made? We saw earlier, um, if we 
make decisions and accept all those capital planning expenditures, what the impact is going to be in our budget. So <clears throat> just, I guess, uh, what we're asking is that you bring what we need to do and what we're asking you to do is to plan to bring the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. Um, if I use an analogy, during his hockey career, Wayne Gretzky was quoted as saying, he always went where the puck was going to be and not where the puck, not where the puck was. So what we need to do, I'm suggesting, is we need to look ahead and we need to look where the puck is going and where as council <coughs> we need to go. Um, and so that we're we're there when the puck gets there. So I'm gonna turn over to Donna for Thank you. So the purpose of tonight's meeting is in, to ensure that council and staff are well positioned to move forward with the 2018 budget and prepare for the next term of council. In 2017, we have made great strides in gathering reports and studies to give us the factual information to help us plan into the future. We have the asset management plan, the roads needs study, bridge study, museum report, the airport report, which is going to be presented to you in the near future, the public works building assessment reports, camera work, then the water and sewer master plan. Now we can compile information from all these reports to create a focus for our future. The cost of studies and plans is significant and it takes away from the actual construction, but it is necessary on a go forward basis so that we continue to create these long-term plans. We need to educate and engage the public on the needs and the cost to maintain and replace our existing infrastructure and we will have the backup documentation to support those findings. Our next step is to work on the numbers part of the budget and set up some meeting dates to work our way through the 2018 draft budget. As always, the budget is harder and more difficult each year, and it is an exercise in teamwork. We all have to work together to get a positive result. So I look forward to working with all of you through this year's draft budget. So does council have any comments uh, regarding information that they have? Oh, um, my only comment would be I don't think anything on that anything on those slides should be a surprise to anybody sitting in this room. Um, and I think the, the, the real focus needs to be on on needs rather than wants um, going forward from, a, from an infrastructure perspective, from a service level perspective, from from everything that we look at perspective. Um, at no point anymore do we, do we just say, we have it, let's keep it. That, that shouldn't be a, a discussion um, because we hear it every day, probably more than once, is taxes are too high and based on the comments on some of those slides, the minute you say we're raising taxes 2.6% a year for the next 20 years, I can just already hear my phone ringing. Um, so we need to figure out ways to balance that because I don't know about the rest of, of council, but I can't, I can't see that being a positive thing. <coughs> um, even though we say we have the greatest services and we do, I, mean, I but the issue has always been those services come with a cost. And, and sometimes people don't see that cost as, a, as an adherence to, to growth and development. So I think that's the concern that we have is that we need to take a real hard look at what we have and do we really, really need it. If we don't, we need to make the tough decision now and, and, and focus on those tough decisions because that's going to it's, it, in my mind, we are at a crossroads right now of a make or break. We need to figure out what that those needs are. Yeah, 
that if you look at it, what I was going to comment, what we see keeping coming out of the provincial government is this especially involving police services and the provincial government having this attitude that municipal governments will be responsible for having everything to keep their people, their uh, residents completely covered. There cannot be an accident. There cannot be things go wrong. And that this proposed Safe Ontarians Act, uh, that amalgamating many of the police service boards in the smaller areas, and just that you shall have a community safety plan in so many areas <coughs> that I'm not sure the 2% a year in cost of living can be accommodated with what's coming out of Toronto. I don't think we can do it for 2% unless we have a provincial government back off on the downloading on us. Um, Following through on what Councillor Sykes said, I think there's a number of places and wrecking facilities and public works. We may have to say, instead of having grass cut every week, that may be every 10 days to, to two weeks if we have a drier uh, year, and it's not that I'm saying that that, but from what we're up against, we're going to have to look at a number of those things that if we compare 20% of the time, effort, wear and tear on machinery out we may have to do that. Councillor oh, Hallahan? Oh, you uh, read in some very good comments and, and sites too, and this is one of the best presentations mm -hmm. that I've had since we have used user digital staff. When I look at this graph and I see that more protection and rec are compared to our planning and development. It just blows it out of the water. And I know we have to have protection. But, and I don't think taxpayers mind paying for what they need. But when you look at the operating expenses here, they can't afford it. They can't afford it. So, so it's just going to have to be extreme. Deputy Reeve Campbell? I agree with everything we've said here. And one of the things that touched on from Councillor Stipe, Stipe over there that the uh, how do we decide what we need and what we don't need? There's going to be a real outcry from the public when we say we don't need that any longer. And, and it's going to weigh heavy on us that we can't afford this any longer, but the public don't understand we can't this any longer and it's, it's going to be I figure one of the toughest decisions that we're going to come up with here is saying we can't have this we, we just can't afford this any longer Looks like, you know in, in the conversation about what the public um, I, I think in some respects we don't give them credit for what they may or may not know I, I think the public truly understands their tax bill at the when they get it. What they don't understand is if what the impact to your taxes would be if you took something away. So if you take it away, what does that truly do? And then honestly, the way our financial situation is today, 
even if you were to take those services away, you're not necessarily dropping their taxes. All it's going to go is to go to something else that we are underfunded for from the last for the next 20 years. So I think that is the, the, the idea we need to get through to the public is to say, you know, if, if we find savings or if we find a service adjustments or whatever that case may be, is the taxes that you paid in 2017 going to drop? No, they're not. Will they go up 2.5%? We don't know. But I'm telling you, they're not going to go down anytime soon based on what the ideas of our inflation and all the services that we have. If we reduce services at some point in the future, they may go down. But they're not going down for a lot. Probably the next 15 years, in my mind, based on what the debt we have and all the other things. So. The sooner we get that out in the public, and the sooner these services are understandable, the, the need is we are going to have every, ch every change you make the service, we're going to have a backlash. We've had it every time it's come. Airport, <coughs> like list them, waste, all of it. Like it's, they've all come and they've all had their groups and, and stuff who are passionate about that. And I, and I respect that. But at the end of the day, those groups need, if, if you want it, pony up, because that's, that's the, the, the rest of the taxpayer is going to have to pay for it too. And I don't think every taxpayer wants to pay for certain things. So that's, that's the dilemma that we have. I think we give, we don't give the public a lot of credit in the sense that they know what they're paying for. I think they do. The issue is they think if we take something away, they should reduce, the tax should reduce. They don't understand we're, we're underfunded in some of the things that we should have been funded long before this council was on, was on board. Like this is not this; these problems didn't just happen with this term of council. This has happened 15, 20 years ago. That we as councillors today are having to make these tough decisions. Is it, is it fair? No, but that's why we're elected. So we need to make those difficult change and right the ship that was wrong. No, Deputy Campbell, Leave Campbell. And I agree, Trevor, with what you said. But when we start looking at, at the services, we have three different municipalities. I'm not taking that apart. But some of the other ones pay to give services to other parts that you receive no services about. You know, and those, 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 some of those services, like we've got no sidewalks in the council. You know, and we spend a lot of money on the sidewalks. We don't have to go very far from here, and the sidewalks are not clean. The public have to come up and cover some of these services that we are providing. We don't have to go very far that they have to clean their own sidewalk in front of their home, and if it's not done, the doctor comes in and cleans it, but they are built for that. And when we start talking things like that, I'm going to have to put more chairs in the gallery. I think. I don't know. These are things that we really have to start looking at, what we're providing that we really shouldn't be providing. And I don't know how you get away from it. And I know there's going to be a backlash, but I think it has to happen. I'll just make the comment. And then this is probably the senior management. What are we mandated to provide within your department and to what level are we obligated? Uh, think of that uh, for all the senior managers as we're going through it. Did you have another point, Trevor? I, I just think, you know, I, I, every change in every board and every committee that I've ever been on, when you start talking about change, line up the chairs. Yep. Everybody comes. If you were to say status quo on anything, it's crickets. You could you could blast a bowling ball through somewhere and you're not going to hit anybody. The change is what is affects people. And I and I I respect the fact that they're passionate. I really do about the things that we've always had and we've always learned about. But there is a cost to those those needs, and 
And that's the thing we, we have to keep drilling. And then, you know, as, as tough of those decisions are, I don't think we can, we can just take the, take the idea of the public and, and understand that unless you have 3,000 rate payers or 6,000 rate payers in the room all screaming the same thing, we have to understand who are the screamers? Who are they? Because if you've got only 1% of the people doing the screaming and nobody else is questioning it, then maybe that's not, maybe that's not the wrong answer. Maybe we are making the right decision based on the screaming of 1%. That's why I have, that's why I always like to know, I ask the public, let us know. And not just, not just the ones who are the, the naysayers and all the ones who, who think it's not going to change. Everybody needs a voice. And we are that voice because we're elected. But they still need, if they don't agree with what we're talking about, we need to hear from them and not just the same people we hear from all the time. Because that's not the same, because we don't know whether that's the real need or it's just somebody who doesn't like the fact that what the way we do things. So, you know, that's the part that I'm trying to gain from my last three years is if you don't like what you're seeing, let us hear about it. And we, as contrary to popular belief, there is ways that you can talk to us that you don't have to worry about. There's ways that we can talk to us at a council meeting, after council meetings, whatever, to get your points across. So it's not a fact of that we're, sh it's an open closed case here. That's not the fact that it is. So let's get that information and make the decision based on what really people want. Not the fact that we've got the 1% or the 3%. If I've got 6,000 people coming in here, there's a pretty good chance there's a change that I'm probably not going to make. No matter what. Because they really, really want it. If I got 1%, I'm going to really make a real hard chance and maybe that's not the right, that change maybe can happen and it's not going to really impact anything. It's based on information we gather from the public, from the staff, everything. I think we, we too much time, we take the backlash as, oh no, well, I don't want that. Let's not make that call because I don't want to make that decision. I think sometimes we need to make the decision and see what the result is. And I think you'd be surprised that at the end of the day, you're not going to hear as much backlash as you think. That's my... That's my take from what I've been in three years. You, some of you have been counselors a lot longer than me. But there's a lot of councils that are having the same discussion about debt and about, and about reserve deficits. And they're all having the same discussion today that we are. And I'm sure they're making the same points that they're not going to make their decisions based on 1% of the public. They're going to make them based on what's the most beneficial for the entire municipality. Not by ward, but for the entire municipality as a whole. Councillor Vaughn. I apologize for being late. I didn't realize the meeting was early. <laughs> Maybe you just came too early before. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, there are a number of things I'd like to raise. Uh, one is the fact that a lot of time uh, we're concerned with building community and as we build events and activities in the community we, we can get a lot of praise and we can draw a lot of people to the community but it's the taxpayer that has to pay the bill and the taxpayer is not necessarily benefiting to the same degree uh, that we would like and so that's we, we, we kind of people expect us to support a lot of things that we really can't justify in terms of the tax bill that's coming at the end of it. Another thing that I think that we need to start thinking about more and more is public and private partnerships. Uh, I think, uh, in line with uh, what we've just heard, we need the community to do more, and I think that. Uh, they, they need the people need to realize that the taxpayer can't ca carry the load for everything that they, we might want to do 
Oh, uh, I've heard some talk at the, in this room lately about uh, the possibility of, of closing arenas, for example. No, that would be a disaster. Uh, that would be a disaster from many perspectives. Looking at, at it from a, the standpoint of life, um, that's a that's a, a disaster that we can't afford. It's, it's too part, too much important. Has too much importance to the community, not just to, to for the sports, but for the threshers and many other reasons. Uh, so before we do a thing like that. Uh, I think we need to look at other other possibilities, such as perhaps a private partner uh, an arrangement where the community um, takes over all of, or a large part of of uh, community center activities and, and and services with a lot of volunteers and so on. I think if we look at our budget. Uh, the, the, the big programs are the ones that get looked at because they're, they're, they have the juiciest result potential. And, and in our case, it's the recreation programs. And uh, I, I think we, we may have to uh, make some changes there, but it affects so many people in so many ways. And, and I, I see us coming down the road to a, a kind of an educational program with an attachment to it in terms of of uh, a vote from the public as to what services, what activities you feel we absolutely must have. And if we can get a, enough participation in that kind of activity, uh, it, it involves a, 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 an education in terms of explaining to people what, what the effects are of uh, Huge costs like this, and how much they cost, and and uh, what are the payoffs for those things, and we can have some comfort in knowing that the terrible decisions that we're going to have to make down in the future have some basis in terms of how the public feel about those things, and how many people would be affected, and in what ways will they be affected. <coughs> well. I'll make the comment on uh, protection of services for our residents. There is so much in provincial legislation now, and if certain things pass that are introduced in the legislature now, uh, that will be even a higher cost. And at the population we have, it is pretty expensive per person. But the one thing that I will say, and I'm going back to when I came back into municipal politics towards 11 years ago, one of the things that was looked at at that time, especially in North Huron, we wanted recreational programs for the youth and i think yes we paid more there but on a per capita basis from those opp statistics that we had for huron county youth crime on per incident is about half of the Huron County average. So I think in having youth involved in things, we have had a certain amount of success there, but it doesn't come without a cost. That's just a comment. Uh, other comments? Sorry. Going back to Dwayne then. So, um, I guess going forward, so as I've been, as Don and I have indicated, so we're, we'll be bringing back, we'll start bringing back numbers, we're going to be working with the department heads, and we'll start bringing back numbers for council's uh, consideration for the 2018 budget. Um, but I guess if possible, I'd like to get some idea in terms of the level of detail that council would be looking for 
in those numbers. In terms of, so you can go right down to line by line. You can do categories. You know, there's different there's different levels of detail, and it's in terms of, and the and the further the deeper you go in the detail, the more information you get. But it's in terms of um, your role as council is making the decision on your overall budget, right? So what inf what level of information do you require or are you looking for so you can make a decision um, about the overall budget? Is that my clear? Uh, <laughs> well, what I take from it and my reply that we need at least category and major lines within that category where the where senior management look at that we possibly need change or could stand to change uh, that if they have ideas on how we could cut something back uh, without losing the main effect of it or what we would have to do to move forward. Uh, I think we're going to put an awful burden on staff if we tell them to go to line to line to start doing that. Councillor Sight? No, yeah, and, I, and I, I would tend to agree. What, what my thinking is, is that if, if we see the department budget, we got the detail for the top, the, the operating expenses, maybe it's the, the, the top four largest operating expenses in the budget, what that backup or what that detail may represent as well as the, the revenue side and the, the, the talk set, what that looks like. To understand so that we get a clear picture of what what makes the department run. Um, like I'm not, I'm not concerned about supplies other than the fact that, you know, all the little stuff can add up too. But what I'm, what I'm looking for is the large ticketed items, the stuff that really makes those departments tick and cost so much to understand what impact those might have to to service changes to whatever that result is because some of those costs are fixed and no matter whether we have the service or not we're going to have it it's the stuff that's variable in in, in the service that i'm more concerned about because those are going to be the impacts to when when we make a decision on a service or a change in service those are going to get impacted, not the fact that, you know, I, whether we have whatever in administration, you're still going to buy a pair of paper. I got, it's not what I need to know. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm looking at the large ticket salaries, equipment, equipment stuff, that type of stuff. How does that impact the overall aspect of the budget by, by department? Because I, I think sometimes we don't really necessarily get how the departments operate. And I, that helps us determine whether we we think we need it, or the department heads telling us that we need it. it it's a little different conversation or context on whether we think it is, because what we think and what actually occurs could be completely different. Deputy Reeves, I'm thinking of deliveries of service, and and how do we? say it may break those down like the rural plows come out twice in the winter time twice a day we see the rural plows twice a day <coughs> but we're getting more people now that are working at the farms some of them come home at 11 o'clock at night and i had a lady say well i need my my side road plow at 10 30 quarter to 11 because i'm coming home and i said but you might be the only one that needs it and it's not something that we can provide that service for. But we don't know how, what that service actually costs us, even, even the sidewalks. Like, what, what does it really cost us to do some of these things? If there's not a significant price, I'm not saying follow roads three times a day. I'm not saying that at all. 
But but some of these costs we really have no idea of how of how they're actually and I think they can be broke down to say, okay, we, we need to know this. I don't know if you can. It's just it, I know we deliver a lot of services that cost us a lot of money, and I think if we had an idea of what these were costing us, it would help us to make a a better decision to say maybe we don't need that or maybe we should keep that service on i i don't know it's it's just there is some cost for deliveries that we don't really know and where they are mm -hmm. councillor say i think councillor campbell is making a very good point in the fact that we we go on the assumption that we have the service here's all the services in that in that department we physically don't know what each of those services individually cost us. Mm -hmm. And and we <clears throat> we've never had that. And some of the some of it is basically that is a fact. We just haven't had that data. I'm sorry. The question though that needs to be is right now we cannot have that data to make these decisions. If we if we were to try to make those decisions without that data, I think we'd be we'd be foolish in doing that. Because we have no real understanding of what those those services cost. So I think, you know, as as, as much as we we have to say, well, maybe we don't have it. I think we need to figure out how we get those costs, and maybe they're not scalpel accurate, but at least we got we got to have senior management and, and staff and information at our hands to at least allow us to have at least the grenade style approach on that we'd at least be able to know what approximately those costs would be so that we know what the impact would be. Um, and that would, that because everything that we're gonna decide has a ripple effect. And the ripple effect is what we need to understand when it comes to, to making these big and difficult decisions. Well, I say that again. Yeah, we, we, we seem to be talking you know, all about the same thing. And, and it's all about our operating expenses. That's where our problem is. When we look at this, it's our operating expenses. I don't have problems in, my, in the municipality with the roads anymore. And I just go back, well, I want them all tired. <laughs> but I was going to say, I will come, but I don't with the, with the service that we've had this last while. I haven't had no problem with it. And I, can I go back and say the same thing as I did before? Great parents don't mind paying for something they need. But by God, it hurts for something they feel they don't need. And they do need the road proud. And they do need it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> anyway, no, that's what it is. It's, it's common sense for God's sake. Well, geez, for, further to this, in ballpark, I know that the county engineer made the comment a year ago every time every county snowplow and salt truck went out it was 80,000 to do all the routes in the county there's all kinds of times where southern patrol <laughs> isn't doing the same as is the auburn patrol or the rocks that are patrol uh, it always used to be the northern uh, patrols had maybe uh, a third more snow to plow, a third more hours of having the machines on the road. And I know even last winter, there was times when streamers came in and hit Blythe that didn't hit Wingham and vice versa. So that, but sort of a ballpark of, okay, what happened? What's the cost of plowing every road once during the day? If it's snowing and blowing, we got to send them out at four o'clock to do it again in the afternoon uh, to allow people. Most of the people within the township drive vehicles that they realize they will be driving through a bit of snow at some time during the day. Um, so that it isn't like a Toronto where 
the all season tires do all year round. Um, thank you. Councillor Vaughn. Uh, it seems to me that most of the time when we're packing the budget, we pick this little thing and that little thing, and we try to pick enough little things that actually brings things down to another percentage point lower. Something to that effect. I think given the circumstances that all of us have been describing, require something bigger than that. And maybe this is just the same thing as, as uh, James has said. <coughs> I think we should be asking the department heads to look at their department and decide uh, one or two or three programs that could be eliminated. Not necessarily that we want to, do, to eliminate them, but we could eliminate them. And the, the, the two or three programs that would have perhaps the, the, the least negative impact on the community but one thing that could be pulled out of the mix and, and that's those are program costs those are operational costs as well as perhaps uh, some capital costs we don't know but it seems to me we're, we're going to need to look at, at larger bits not just bits and pieces of, of uh, things that we cut back on and that's one thing I would suggest that we that we approach to uh, ask the department who know best what how the department operates and, and what what are the impacts of doing major changes. Uh, asking them what project or program service could we eliminate to the best effect. But and also, I think the flip side is, what are the other opportunities for revenue that we can generate from those programs? I think that's like we we, we always talk about expenses. We we sometimes have this as much skin in the game with regards to setting rates or setting fees or whatever that we need to establish to ensure that whatever that case may be. So I think we need to have it both both full. Just don't look for the sort of the one you, you can take out, but maybe we can enhance by changing, changing the revenue stream or doing something to the revenue stream that, that would make it, make it more attractive to keep. I, I think those, it's gotta be a full compassing look. And I think you know, it's difficult for staff because they're gonna say, well, what does that mean for the council? Does the council wanna do it? Well, I, I think the, the issue is we don't know because we don't know what it costs and we don't know what the impact so some of those recommendations and some of those recommendations are probably coming more than once is my as i look at some senior managers mm -hmm. here those probably have come once before maybe not in this council term but they maybe they have we i think we all are are, are now smelling the coffee about the, the issues that we have and we need to focus on them. so but i i, I agree I agree with both full, but we need to look at a, a full encompassing picture. I think that's what we're we're truly looking at. But I think we truly are looking for staff to recommend stuff. And I think we all, when they, when we all, when those recommendations come, we need to understand that we need to make sure we're making the right decision, and not just because it's a, the, the, the difficult or the easy decision to keep. Is it the right decision to make? I think we need to give our staff when we do make an achievement that we recognize that this is an achievement. This is like I don't think and maybe Val will, will back me up on this, but we've never had a waiting list down at the daycare very many times. This year we have a waiting list for kids to get in. And so we're doing we're doing something right. And so we need to say, thanks, you're, you're doing something right. And maybe we're too cheap, I don't know. And that's why we're getting more kids. Or maybe we've got, well, that's not the main reason we got more kids, is it? No. Uh, 
but but I think <laughs> so often we, we never get the credit to some of those people who have who have made some big sacrifices to get to the place where they are. And they're doing a great job. And we need to tell them that they're doing a great job. I wouldn't want to tell her right now that, hey, we got to cut back here. She's finally making us a profit. I've never saw her budget come through that there was ever a problem for her. So I've been on So you're doing a job. That's an easy one. Well, I shouldn't say it's an easy one. It's an easy one. For Ten counsel. years ago, it was a lot different. And I have to say thank right. you uh, yeah. to the management that has been down there because council 11 years ago was thinking of having to eliminate it. That there was some years, it was over 200,000 a year that came out of tax money uh, to subsidize it uh, at that time. And that there's been a lot of hard work by those in that department to make it as close to revenue neutral as possible. That's just one of the things. Go ahead, it's an expendable service. So when you throw out to the table, I'm just going to say this, like you can eliminate as counselors, it's your your reflection of what your priorities are and you can eliminate any service you want but does it really change the value of what you're spending because you can eliminate mine but really at this point that's not going to save you any money so it's a service we're providing in the community that also perhaps has side benefits so you have to be the visionary people who say oh but then that draws the people in and keeps the people in our community and it builds up the services and i can't place a value on that and Maybe it's just the ebb and flow of, of costs and things like that, so that perhaps in another department you're going to have to make tough decisions and they'll change some things and then it will even out again too. So you guys have the hardest decisions to make. So we can bring you all those numbers and all those services we can cut, but you have to be willing to do it and you have to decide what's going to bring in the best, you know, return for your buck and make those decisions. And I think as Blaine saying like you guys get to decide what services you're offering but I think you need to like I heard you say about revenues like you have opportunities for revenues and if people want those services they're going to pay for them and if they don't want to pay for them then they're going to say fine get rid of it mm -hmm. so you know you can make your cuts or make your choices and see how your community responds and that's probably the toughest decisions you guys have to make and I'm glad I'm not going to just bring you the numbers <laughs> <laughs> I just, have you got enough information from us about what you think you, you should, should bring us back? I think there's I been have. lots of discussion, so I I just want to make sure before <laughs> that I think we've we've hit every head twice. Brady expenses. That's all I know. Hard job. Wow. Okay. Uh, that. Uh, for this, we need a motion that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby receive the preparation for 2018 budget process presentation of the CAO and Director of Finance for information purposes. Councillor Hallahan, uh, Deputy Reeve Campbell, all in favor? Carried. Do we have dates? Ideas for a next meeting? <clears throat> to be announced? I think um, we will bring forward, so we meet as council next Monday, so we will bring forward um, some dates uh, for council's consideration. Uh, but we are looking, though, in terms of definitely 2017, most likely early part of December. So, But we'll bring you back some at next Monday's meeting. Okay. Um, ready for the all important motion? Yeah. Confirmatory bylaw. Number 106, 2017. Being a bylaw to confirm general. Previous actions of the Council of the Council of North 
to be introduced, read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the reading clerk, and engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Seif, Councillor Ritzman Tavinga, all in favor? Carried. Councillor Vaughn, Councillor Hallahan, all in favor? Carried. Just a reminder that tomorrow night's meeting. 